What is the fetish of the hour that all the bourgeoisie recognize? Eh, Mr. Belloc? Science. Since bombs are your means of expression, it would be really telling to throw one into pure mathematics. Don't you think the blowing up of the first meridian is bound to raise a howl of execration? I give you a month. On February the 16th, 1894, an anarchist bomber called Marshal Burdan accidentally blew himself up in Greenwich Park. The Times of that morning reported a bottle in many places which had apparently contained an explosive substance was found near the spot where the explosion took place and it is conjectured that the deceased man fell and caused its contents to explode. This explosion inspired Conrad's great metropolitan novel, The Secret Agent, which though it deeply shocked his Edwardian audience, provided the 20th century with a new, bleakly comic, terrible vision of London and its inhabitants. By the time The Secret Agent was published in 1907, Conrad's reputation was already securely founded on a series of tales based on his own seafaring days in the exotic East, such as The Nigger of the Narcissus, Typhoon and Lord Jim, and securely founded above all on Heart of Darkness, which was based on a voyage Conrad took up the Congo River, and which is the greatest novella in the English language. However, it was with Nostromo in 1904 that Conrad became increasingly preoccupied with revolutionary politics and with the intricate relationship of the individual to the workings of society and to the processes of history. When he returned to these themes and relocated them in London, it is perhaps not surprising, therefore, that he should be attracted to the bombing of Greenwich, the Seaman's Shrine. The attempt to blow up the Greenwich Observatory was a blood-stained inanity of so fatuous a kind that it was impossible to fathom its origin. One felt amusing before the phenomenon, even of the past, of South America, a continent of crude sunshine and brutal revolutions, of heaven's frowns and smiles, the reflector of the world's light. Then the vision of an enormous town presented itself, of a monstrous town, more populous than some continents, and in its man-made might, as if indifferent to heaven's frowns and smiles, the cruel devourer of the world's light, there was room enough there to place any story, depth enough for any passion, variety enough there for any setting, darkness enough to bury five million lives. Mr. Verloc, going out in the morning, left his shop nominally in charge of his brother-in-law. Wrong way round. The shop was small, and so was the house. It was one of those grimy brick houses, a square box of a place with the front glazed in small panes. The window contained nondescript packages in wrappers like patent medicines, photographs of more or less undressed dancing girls hung across a string as if to dry, and a few books with titles hinting at impropriety, badly printed, with titles like The Torch and The Gong, rousing titles. The bell, hung on the door by means of a curved ribbon of steel, was difficult to circumvent. But the evening visitors nodded familiarly to Mrs. Verloc and lifted up the flap at the end of the counter in order to pass into the back parlour. As for Mrs. Verloc, she had an equable soul. She felt profoundly that things do not stand much looking into. There is no law and no certainty. The teaching propaganda be hanged. The door was the only means of entrance to the house in which Mr. Verloc carried on his business as a seller of shady wares, exercised his vocation as a protector of society, and cultivated his 
domestic virtues. The Verlocks had no children, but as Winnie found an object of quasi-maternal affection in her brother, perhaps this was just as well for poor Stevie. For he was difficult, that boy. He had learned to read and write, but as an errand boy, he did not turn out a great success. However, he never had any fits, which was encouraging. He helped his sister with blind love and docility in her household duties, and his spare time he occupied by drawing circles with compass and pencil, with great industry. Such was the house Mr. Verloc left behind him on his way westward at half past ten in the morning. It was unusually early for him, and he surveyed the evidence of the town's opulence and luxury with an approving eye. All those people had to be protected. The whole social order had to be protected against the shallow enviousness of unhygienic labor. Mr. Verloc would have rubbed his hands with satisfaction had he not been constitutionally averse to every superfluous exertion. I have here some of your reports. We are not very happy with the attitude of the police here. Every country has its police. I have no means of action upon the police here. What is desired is the occurrence of something definite to stimulate their vigilance. That is within your province, is it not? You are very corpulent. What were you pleased to say? What do you mean, letting yourself get out of condition like this? You don't even have the physique of your profession. You, a desperate mm, socialist or anarchist, which is it? Anarchist. Bosh. You wouldn't deceive an innocent. How long have you been employed by the embassy? Eleven years. Ever since the time of the late Baron Stott Wartenheim. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> what did you get from the French for obtaining the design of their new field gun? Five years rigorous confinement. In a fortress. You got off easily, and anyhow, it serves you right for letting yourself get caught. You are a lazy fellow. And during the time of Stadtwarten time, we had a lot of soft-headed people in this embassy. Well, a secret service is not a philanthropic institution. The proper business of an agent provocateur is to provoke. As far as I can judge from your reports, you've done nothing to earn your money for the past three years. Nothing. I have several times prevented what would have been serious bomb outrage. What is the fetish of the hour that all the bourgeoisie recognize, eh, Mr. Verloc? You are too lazy to think. The sacrosanct fetish of today is science. An attempt upon a crowned head or president is effective enough in a way, but not as much as it used to be. It's almost conventional. A bomb outrage to have any influence on public opinion now must go beyond. It must be purely destructive. You anarchists should make it clear you are prepared to make a clean sweep of the whole of social creation. But how to get that appallingly absurd idea into the heads of the middle classes? by directing your blows at something outside the ordinary passions of humanity is the answer. Science. Since bombs are your means of expression, it would be really telling to throw one into pure mathematics. <laughs> but that is impossible. So, what do you think about having a go at astronomy? The whole civilized world has heard of Greenwich. Don't you think the blowing up of the first meridian is bound to raise a howl of execration? I give you a month. The sittings of the conference are suspended. Before it reassembles again, something must have happened or your connection with us ceases. Conrad's villainous ambassador is a thinly disguised caricature of a Russian diplomat. 
which is hardly surprising. For although he's now regarded as one of the great English novelists, Conrad was a Pole and only learned English in his 20s. He was born Joseph Theodor Konrad Kozniowski in the Russian-occupied Ukraine in 1857 and harboured a lifelong hatred of the Tsarist oppressors. His parents were members of the landowning nobility, highly cultured and dedicated to the cause of Polish nationalism. When Conrad was only five, they were arrested for underground political activities and sentenced to exile in northern Russia. Illness killed his mother when he was seven, his father when he was eleven. Conrad learned the realities of political oppression at an early age. When he was sixteen, Conrad took the most dramatic action of his life. Isolated and lonely at home and thirsting for adventure, he fled to Marseille in France, determined to go to sea. After a period spent getting little work and hanging aimlessly around the docks, he succeeded in starting a career as a merchant seaman and eventually joined the British Merchant Service in 1878. The next 15 years were probably the happiest of his life. He sailed all over the world in a variety of ships, eventually rising to the position of master on the Otago. He found in the fellowship of the crews the sense of stability and community that his life had lacked and the contrast between the ordered world of the ships and the anarchic violence of the sea was to provide him with the major theme of his writing. That theme still occupied him when, at the age of 50, he began The Secret Agent. He described the sea as being a mirror, you know, in his sea books. And I think by a mirror he means you see yourself, your own portrait. I think he saw his own portrait of another kind in, in the London scene. Conrad it was, as an emigre, he was isolated. He'd lost his country. He was in a strange place. Therefore, he's living in a state of actual physical isolation. But also, it is a moral uh, 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 isolation because his uh, sense of his own values has been left behind. And he's always been interested in cases, as it were, of adventure, of going from a safe environment into an absolutely dangerous or distant one in which you lose everything. Now the question is, when you've lost all your support, can you still bring yourself together? Can you make a stand for it? And it, over and over again in his books, people are all either tested in this way, either they go under or they, they survive. All idealization makes life poor. To beautify it is to take away its character and its complexity. Leave that to the moralists, my boy. History is made by men, but they do not make it in their heads. Capitalism made socialism, and laws made by capitalists for the protection of property are responsible for anarchism. No one can tell what form a social organization of the future may take. There is no law. There is no certainty. The only thing that matters to us is the emotional state of the masses. Without emotion, there can be no action. I'm speaking to you scientifically. Scientifically. Damn. Hmm? What did you say, Verloc? Nothing. Do you know how I would call the nature of the present economic conditions? Cannibalistic, that's what it is. They are nourishing their greed on the quivering flesh and the warm blood of the people. Nothing else. Bad world for poor people. Very good. Very characteristic. Perfectly typical. What's very really good? Typical of this sort of degeneracy, these drawings, I mean. You would call the lad a degenerate, would you? Well, that's what he may be called scientifically. Very good type, too, altogether of that sort of degenerate. One has only to glance at the lobes of his ears. Verloc was not satisfied with his friend. In the light of Mr. Vladimir's philosophy of bomb throwing, he appeared hopelessly futile. The part of Mr. Verloc in revolutionary politics having been to observe, he could not all at once, in his own home, take the initiative for action. Loafing was all very well for fellows like Ossipon, who knew not Mr. Vladimir and would always want for nothing as long as there were silly girls with saving bank books in the world. 
There is no occupation that fails a man more completely than that of a secret agent. Mr. Verloc descended into the abyss of moral reflections. He felt the latent unfriendliness of all outdoors with a force approaching bodily anguish. And suddenly, the face of Mr. Vladimir, clean-shaven and witty, appeared in haloed in the glow of its rosy complexion like a sort of pink seal impressed on the fatal darkness. I, I don't feel very well. Giddiness? Yes. Not at all well. You catch cold standing there. Taking's very small today. That poor boy is in a very excited state again tonight. I haven't been feeling well for the past few days. He hears too much of what goes on here. If I'd have known he was coming tonight, I'd have made sure he went to bed at the same time I did. He's out of his head now with something he heard about eating people's flesh and drinking blood. What's the good of talking like that? Oh, ask Ossie Bon. He isn't fit to hear what's said here. He believes it's all true. I wish you'd take him out with you more, Adolf. He'll lose sight of me, get lost in the street. He won't. You don't know him. That boy worships you. He'd walk through fire for you. You might be father and son. What's the good of printing things like that? I had to take the carving knife out of his hand yesterday. He was shouting and stamping. He can't bear the notion of any cruelty. Shall I put the light out now? Yes, put it out. The Secret Agent is a dark, bleak novel. Some of his first reviewers thought it brutal. But it is clear today that Conrad's vision anticipated the essential spirit of our century. At the centre of this dark book is the figure of Stevie, Mrs. Verloc's half-witted brother. Through him, Conrad expresses his profound pity for what he called a mankind always so tragically eager for self-destruction. Like Dostoevsky's prince in The Idiot, Stevie is the moral core of the secret agent. As the various characters respond to him and use him, so we judge them. More importantly, Stevie is the very type for Conrad of a dumb, gullible humanity primed to be the victims of such demagogues and fanatics as Ossipon, who trade upon the credulities of mankind. In the next scene, we meet a new character, the Professor, who, like Stevie, is sincere and half an idiot. But within the scheme of the book, he operates as Stevie's natural opposite. Whereas Stevie is a vessel of emotion, the Professor is the logical devotee of a single mad idea. At the turn of the century, the crazy professor or mad dynamiter devoted to destruction was the bugaboo of the Victorian press and a stock figure in historical romances. Conrad's attitude to the professor, however, is distinctly un-English. His professor is no conventional villain. Rather, he is, in Conrad's words, a serious attempt to illustrate a mental and emotional state which has its weight in the affairs of this world. <laughs> I'm very much mistaken. You are the man who would know the inside of this confounded affair. Have you been out much today? No, I stayed in bed all morning. Why? Nothing. Did you walk here? No, omnibus. Been sitting here long? An hour or more. And it's possible you haven't heard the news on the street. Have you? It's wonderful that you, of all people, should have heard nothing of it. Do you give your stuff to anybody who asks for it? As long as I have a pinch by me. That's a principle. It's a principle. Do you mean to say you'd hand it over to a tech if one were to ask you for some of your wares? They won't come near me. They know very well I take care never to part with the last handful of my wares. I have it always by me in a thick glass flask. So I have been told. I walk always with my left hand closed round the India rubber ball which I have in my trouser pocket. The pressing of this ball actuates a detonator inside the flask which I carry in my breast pocket. The tube leads up here like this. See? It's instantaneous, of course. Far from it. Full 20 seconds must elapse before the explosion. Phew. 
20 seconds? Do you mean you could face that? 20 seconds and then... Nobody in this room could hope to escape. But that by itself means absolutely nothing in the way of protection. What is effective is the belief those people have in my will to use it. In the last instance, it is character alone that makes for one's own safety. There are individuals of character among that lot, too. Possibly. But I'm not impressed by them. Therefore, they are inferior. They depend on life, which is complex and open to attack at every point. I depend on death, which is simple and cannot be attacked. My superiority is evident. What is it you are after for yourself, then? A perfect detonator. A variable and yet perfectly precise mechanism. A really intelligent detonator. The perfect detonator. Well, I will have to spoil your confidence for you. A man was blown up in Greenwich Park this morning. How do you know? It's in the paper. Bomb in Greenwich Park. There isn't much so far. 11.30, enormous hole in the ground, all around smashed roots and broken branches mixed up with fragments of a man's body. No doubt a wicked attempt to blow up the observatory, they say. Were you expecting that sort of move in this country? I hadn't the slightest idea. Under the present circumstances, it's nothing short of criminal. I am convinced you have been giving some of your stuff away lately. You have? Could you describe the person you gave your stuff to? Describe him? we will describe him to you in one word, Verloc. Verloc? Impossible. Yes. He was a prominent member of your group, I understand. Yes. No. Prominent, not exactly. More useful than important, a man of no ideas, intellectually a non-entity. Did he say anything to you, give you some idea of his intentions? He told me it was to be a demonstration against a building. I had to know that much to prepare the charge. What do you think happened? Can't tell. Either he dropped the thing or simply ran out of time. You can't expect a detonator to be absolutely foolproof. What are you going to do? Under the circumstances, the only policy for the militant revolutionary group is to disclaim all connection with this damn freak of yours. How to make this disclaimer convincing enough is what bothers me. You might ask the police for a testimonial of good conduct. They know where every one of you slept last night. No doubt they are well aware that we had nothing to do with it, but what they'll say is another thing. I wonder what I had better do now. You... You fasten yourself upon the woman for all she's worth. Chief Inspector Heat had had a disagreeably busy day since his department received the first telegram from Greenwich. Not accustomed to examine closely the mangled remains of human beings, he had been shocked by the sight disclosed to his view. Overcoming his physical repugnance, he stretched out his hand and took up the least soiled of the rags. That single piece of cloth was incredibly valuable. He could not defend himself from astonishment at the casual manner in which it had come into his possession. I'm not looking for you. Not yet. When I want you, I shall know where to find you. Then I've no doubt the papers would give you an obituary notice. But you may be exposed to the unpleasantness of being buried together with me. Though I suppose your friends would make an effort to sort us out as much as possible. Whatever you're after, give it up. You'll find we are too many for you. I'm doing my work better than you're doing yours. That'll do now. <laughs> Lunatic. When Conrad wrote The Secret Agent in 1906, he'd been living in London and its surroundings for 15 years. In common with all European cities, it had seen a wave of bombings during the previous 30 years. Anarchists, Fenians, Bolsheviks and other social revolutionaries had all attempted to disrupt the social fabric through violence. And England, with its liberal tradition, provided a haven for the European bombers. 
In the early years of the century, all European governments were terrified of revolution. The increasing effectiveness of the socialist movement, inspired initially by Karl Marx and the international anarchist movement founded by the Russian thinker Michael Bakunin, had led to two nearly successful revolts. The Paris Commune of 1871 and the Russian uprising of 1905. These events provided a very real and topical backdrop to the secret agent. But in choosing anarchism as his subject, Conrad was not expressing any real revolutionary sympathies. Rather, anarchism provided him with a metaphor for his own mordant view of the world. There is, let us say, a machine. It evolved itself out of a chaos of scraps of iron, and behold, it knits. I am horrified at the horrible work and stand appalled. And the most withering thought is that the infamous thing has made itself. Made itself without thought, without conscience, without foresight. It knits us in and it knits us out. It has knitted time, space, pain, death, corruption, despair and all the illusions. And nothing matters. I'll admit, however, that to look at the remorseless process is sometimes amusing. I would like to know if this is the beginning of another dynamite campaign. Uh, don't go into details, I have no time for that. Yes, Sir Ethelred, as far as we can be positive about anything, I can assure you that it is not. I have reason to believe that the perpetrator of this affair is a spy called Verloc in the pay of a foreign government. For that reason, I think this case requires special treatment. I should think so, involving the ambassador of a foreign power. These people are too impossible. What do they mean by importing their methods here? A Turk would have more decency. How would you define it? A shortly. Bare-faced audacity, amounting to childishness of peculiar sort. Well, we can't put up with the innocence of nasty little children. They'll have to get a sharp rap on the knuckles over this affair. What is your general idea? State it shortly, spare me the details. Sir Ethelred, in principle I should lay it down that the existence of secret agents should not be tolerated as tending to augment the positive dangers against the evils of which they are used. Uh, <coughs> I'm keeping clear of details, Sir Ethelred. No, just so. Uh, be as concise as you can. Sir Ethelred. However, I must tell you, this man Verloc is already well known to the police. I took it upon myself seven years ago to promise Furlock that so long as he did not go in for anything obviously outrageous, he would be left alone by us. What do you get in return for your protection? When we want a hint, he can generally furnish it. Mm -hmm. There is a peculiar stupidity and feebleness in the conduct of this affair, which gives me excellent hopes of getting behind it mm -hmm. and finding there something other than an individual freak of fanaticism. Ah. What I want, sir, is a free hand. Well, certainly. I have not the slightest interest in sparing this man Verloc, but our true objective lies behind him. I want your authority to give him such assurances of personal safety as I may think proper. Uh, certainly. Find out as much as you can. Uh, find it out in your own way. I intend to seek this explanation personally, by myself, I mean, where it may be picked up. That is a certain shop in Brett Street, and upon the lips of a certain secret agent, once upon a time, the confidential and trusted spy of the late Baron Stott Wartenheim, ambassador of a great power to the court of St. James. <clears throat> Mrs. Verloc found herself alone longer than usual on the day of the attempted bomb outrage in Greenwich Park, because Mr. Verloc went out very early that morning and did not come back till nearly dusk. She did not mind being alone. She had no desire to go out, and the shop was cosier than the streets. Mr. Verloc would want his tea on his return. He was a good husband, and she had a loyal respect for his rights. What a wretched day. You've been getting wet. Not very. I have you laid up on my hands. I don't think so. Where have you been today? Nowhere.
I've been to the bank. You have? What for? Draw the money out. What do you mean, all of it? Yes, all of it. Might need it soon. I don't know what you mean. Oh, you know you can trust me. Oh, yes. I know I can trust you. If I hadn't trusted you, I wouldn't have married you, would I? You should feed that cold, Adolf. Are your feet wet? We might have to go to the continent. <laughs> what the idea? I'm sick of this life. We'll have to. Have to? Well, I should like to know who's going to make you. You have a bad cold. You'll feel different in a couple of days. You shouldn't make yourself a slave to all those foreign people. Nobody needs to do that in this country. Why should you? You have a comfortable home. The business isn't so bad. And you're not tired of me. If you go to the continent, you'll have to go on your own. You know I wouldn't. No, I know. You couldn't. You'd miss me too much. Exactly. It's the shop, Adolf. I'll go. Husband at home, Mrs. Verloc. Oh, he's unwell. I am sorry for that. I've called to get a little private information. I suppose you know who I am. Come, I'm with the police. Chief Inspector Heat of the Special Crimes Division. Oh, well, I don't bother my head about such things. Mm. Well, I fancy you could give me a pretty good notion of what's going on, if you liked. Going on? What is going on? There has come into our hands an overcoat. The overcoat has a label sewn on the inside with your address written in marking ink. Oh, well, that'll be my brother's then. I wrote that label myself. He's very excitable, you see. But I wonder, how did he come to lose his coat? Where is your brother now? He's been out all day on an errand for my husband. I suppose you recognise this. Well, yes, well, that's... Well, whatever is it torn out like that for? Mrs Verloc. It strikes me that you know more of this bomb affair than you yourself are aware of. Bomb affair? What are you... You? What are you after? I must have a word or two with you. Come into the parlour then. I know that you're at the bottom of this affair. You must have been mad to go in for a thing like that. Who put you up to it? I was driven to it. Embassy, swine. Don't make so much noise. I wish you would take me away with you now, this minute. I would go with you like a lamb. I dare say, but my advice is to clear out. Vanish. All your anarchist friends think you're no longer of this world. They do? Why? Didn't you go for your bond to the professor? What else do you expect them to think? Who would have thought she would hit on a dodge like that? The boy was half an idiot. If he'd been caught, it would have been the asylum for him. Nothing worse. If one... We think he stumbled on a tree root. They had to scrape most of them together with a shovel. Best thing for you is to be gone while your friends still think you are dead. None of our people will try to stop you. As the novel draws towards its close, what Conrad called his technical intention becomes clearer. He described the secret agent as a new departure in genre, involving a sustained, ironical treatment of a melodramatic and sensational subject. 
Conrad always maintained that he deliberately formulated an ironic method that would enable me to say everything I had to say in scorn as well as in pity. Conrad's scorn serves, of course, to distance the reader and illuminates the central theme of the book. Above all, the secret agent is about deception, the secrecy and the systematised lack of communication evident in all strata of society. Conrad's careful use of a non-linear narrative, he delays, for example, the revelation of Stevie's horrible death, reinforces the ways in which the characters are blind to each other's motives. So intricate is Conrad's design, so subtle are his thematic interconnections, that a simple lack of communication between a husband and a wife becomes symptomatic of the fetishistic worship of secrecy at the heart of English society. In 1896, Conrad had married Jessie George and settled into a domestic, if itinerant, life in various parts of the home counties. Though he formed strong literary friendships with the writers H.G. Wells and John Galsworthy, he remained a mystery to them and to others who witnessed his recurring depression and ill health. His wife and two children were also constantly unwell, and this unhealthy family atmosphere became so overwhelmingly oppressive that it undoubtedly contributed to the depiction of claustrophobic and taciturn domesticity in The Secret Agent, and to Conrad's fascination with the mismanagement and lack of proper communication at all levels of society. So it is that Winnie's belief that life does not bear too much looking into is matched by the Home Secretary's busy request, spare me the details. Sir Arthur Red. Well, what is it you found out already? You came upon something unexpected on the first step? Not exactly unexpected, Sir Ethelred. What I came upon was a psychological state. Mm. You must be lucid, please. Only spare me the details, Sir Ethelred. You no doubt know that most criminals, at some time or other, feel an irresistible need of confessing. Mm. In Verloc, I have found a man in that particular psychological state. Mm. It was enough on my part to whisper to him, I know that you are at the bottom of this affair. There remained for me only to ask, who put you up to it? He replied with remarkable emphasis. Mm -hmm. I gather the fellow with the bomb was his brother-in-law. It is rather a curious affair. <clears throat> All this seems very fantastic. Doesn't it? One would think it a ferocious joke. But our man took it seriously, it appeared. He felt himself threatened, I imagine lost his head. My impression is that he thought those embassy people capable not only of throwing him out, but of giving him away too, in some manner or other. Mm -hmm. Though how he could hope to have his share in this business concealed is more than I can tell. <laughs> what have you done with him? Let him go, Sir Ethelred. Hmm? I left him with his wife in the shop. I'll speak to the Attorney General tonight. You say this man had a wife? Uh, yes, sir, a genuine wife. Uh, and a genuinely respectable marital relation. From a certain point of view, we are here in the presence of a domestic drama. <laughs> Inspector Heat? Mr. Vladimir! Rotten weather. Hmm. Mild. We've got hold of a man called Verloc. What? You know him. What makes you say that? I don't. It's Verloc who says that. A lying dog of some sort? <laughs> now, what pleased me most in this affair? is that the prosecution of Mr. Verloc makes such an excellent starting point for cleaning out of this country all the foreign spies and police and that sort of uh, dog. Well, we can't very well seek them out individually. The only way is to make their employment unpleasant to their employers. What do you mean? I have no doubt, Mr. Vladimir, that you have a very precise notion of what I mean. Nobody will believe what a man of that sort says. You will only be feeding up the lying spirit of these revolutionary scoundrels. 
What do you want to make a scandal for? From morality or what? Well, there is a practical side too. We have really enough to do looking after the genuine article. We do not intend to let ourselves be bothered by shams. I can't share your view. It is selfish. I have always felt we should try to be good Europeans. I mean governments and men. Yes, but you look at Europe from its other end. It is your government that grumbles most at our police. You see now, we're not so bad. I wanted particularly to tell you of our success. I'm sure I'm very grateful. We can be sure that Conrad enjoyed unmasking a Russian. But his primary concern was the Verloc family's domestic drama. The closing scenes between Winnie and Verloc and Winnie and Ossipon have been hailed as the most astonishing triumphs of genius in fiction. The most astonishing because we are most aware at this point of the cunning, elegant organisation of the book and of Conrad's extraordinary counterpoint of pity and scorn, of pathos and absurdity. Conrad's ferocious love of the absurd, especially evident in the macabre humour of these closing scenes, led Thomas Mann to claim that the striking feature of modern art is that it ceased to recognise the categories of tragic and comic. Rather, he claimed, with Conrad in mind, modern artists see life as a tragic comedy, with the result that the grotesque is its most genuine style. It was a failure, if not exactly the sort of failure he had feared. If only his wife had not had the unlucky notion of sewing on the address inside Stevie's overcoat. Mr. Verloc, who was no fool, had foreseen and depended on the extraordinary character of the influence he had over Stevie. The eventuality he had not foreseen had appalled him as a humane man and a fond husband. However, from every other point of view, it was rather advantageous. But it remained for him now to face her grief. Mr. Verloc imagined himself loved by that woman, but she had not accustomed him to make confidences. Mrs. Verloc's philosophical, almost disdainful lack of curiosity, the foundation of their accord in domestic life, made it extremely difficult to get into contact with her. How, with his want of practice, could he tell her what he himself felt, but vaguely? I never meant any harm to come to the boy. It's that damn policeman, he upset you. He's a brute blurting it out like that. I made myself ill trying to think of how to break it to you. Oh, you understand, I never meant any harm to come to that boy. It can't be helped. Come, Winnie, we've got to think of tomorrow. We'll need all our wits about us tomorrow. You might look at a fellow. I don't want to look at you as long as I live. What? The mind of Mr. Verloc lacked profundity. Under the mistaken impression that the value of individuals consists in what they are in themselves, he could not possibly comprehend the value of Stevie in the eyes of Mrs. Verloc. Look, you can't sit here like this. Come, this won't bring him back. Do be reasonable, Winnie. What would it have been if you had lost me? By heaven. You know I hunted high and low. I ran the risk of giving myself away trying to find someone else for that accursed job. And I tell you again, I couldn't find anyone crazy enough or hungry enough. Oh, you go to bed now. What you want is a good cry. The self-confident tone grew upon Mrs. Verloc's ear, which let most of the words go by. 
for what were words to her now? What could words do to her, for good or evil, in the face of the atrocity of the thought which occupied her? And she thought, this man took the boy away from his home to murder him. He took the boy away from me to murder him. Then after he had murdered him, he came home to me. Just came home, like any other man would come home to his wife. And I thought he had caught a cold. You're looking more like yourself. Let me tell you, Winnie, that your place is here this evening. You'd better take that confounded hat off. I can't let you go out, old girl. You have a devilish way of holding your tongue sometimes. I am fond of you, but don't go too far. This isn't the time for it, and you can't go out tonight. I wish to goodness I had never seen Greenwich Park. <laughs> Anything belonging to it. <laughs> Winnie! Yes? Come here! <laughs> Of course. I've thought of you often lately. You were coming to the shop? Yes, at once. Directly I read the paper. May I ask where you were going to? No, don't ask me. Never, never mind where I was going. What, what if I were to tell you I was going to find you? I would say you could find no one more ready to help you in your trouble. I've been fond of you beyond words ever since I first set eyes on you, but you seem to live so happily with him. You seem to love him. Love him. Love him. <laughs> I was a good wife to him. I am a respectable woman. You thought I loved him. I was a young girl. I had the boy depending on what I could do. No one can understand it. What was I to do? Unhappy, brave woman. You guessed then he was dead. Yes. You guessed what I had to do. How did you first come to hear of it? From the police. Oh, Tom. They had to gather him up with the shovel. The police? Do you mean to say the police came already? I forgot to close the shop door before I went out. You must hide me somewhere till the morning. I can't take you where I live, and the, the truth is I have no money to find a lodging. We, we revolutionists are not rich. No, but I have the money. Look, I have all the money. Why then? We are saved. Oh, please save me, Tom. Please save me. Hide me. Please don't let them have me. Promise you'll kill me first. What the devil are you afraid of? Haven't you guessed what I was driven to do? You must promise to kill me first. Please stop. The boat train. 10.30. We're all right after all. Nobody's been in. Oh, the light. The light's on in the parlor. There is. Oh, please go and turn it off before I go mad. thing all by yourself? Yes. I wouldn't have believed it possible. Nobody would. Please take me out of the country, Tom. I'll work for you. 
I'll slave for you. I'll love you. I won't ask you to marry me. <laughs> oh, no, please don't throw me off now, Tom. Please. Please, the only way you'll get rid of me is to crush my head underneath your heel. Please don't get leave up. me. <laughs> Let's get away. The boat train. 10.30. By the by, I ought to have the money for the tickets now. The whole process of her coming to life with emotions she's never had before, which has been storing inside her without knowing her. When someone has attacked, in fact, her love, which was her love of this, this uh, unfortunate boy, uh, the whole flare-up then is as though she would reborn. So the whole of her nature comes out into an astonishing way. I find that very impressive indeed. Is it, Tom? Is there any danger? You'll get me off, Tom, won't you? There's no danger. He's an extraordinary lad, that brother of yours. Most interesting case to study. He was that indeed. You took so much notice of him, Tom. I loved you for it. It's, it's almost incredible, the resemblance between you two. Oh, Tom, how can I fear to die when he was taken away from me so cruelly? But I am afraid. I've thought of trying to kill myself, but I, I just couldn't do it. And then you came. Oh, I live all my days for you, Tom. Get over there into the other corner of the carriage, away from the platform. Winnie, at the close, is living proof, firstly, of Comrade Ossipan's contention that without emotion there can be no action, and without action there can be no fundamental change in society. And secondly, as the novel demonstrates, the new freedom she gains at the end from looking deeply into things can be dangerous and self-destructive. In The Modern Wasteland, as T.S. Eliot, one of Conrad's greatest admirers, was to say, humankind cannot bear very much reality. Conrad's work has a prophetic power precisely because he saw that on the one hand mankind wants desperately to live and yet on the other he does not know how to live. And in a world in which our sustaining moral values are either under attack or spent or when eternity itself can be viewed as a damned hole, the single mad idea of the lunatic professors of extermination as the way of progress forecasts the 20th century's monstrous solution to mankind's terrible dilemma. Well, of its kind, I think it is one of the great books, or at any rate, one of the most seminal books. It really defines something which uh, began to be true in his time and is most certainly truer and truer in our own. That is, that in contemporary societies, the, the individual finds himself compromised. He's morally compromised. He's not in a straightforward position at all. Uh, whereas I'm sure in... If only if one had been a Victorian, we would know right from wrong straight away without any doubt, and it would have not. But now, no, we are caught in all sorts of uh, side side issues and traps. And Conrad was immensely well, uh, 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 immensely aware of that, and indeed, uh, that is what stimulated him. It's a great man. The Secret Agent was published in 1907, and though a critical success, it wasn't until 1915, when his later books, Chance and Victory, appeared, that Conrad achieved a wide popular appeal. Although he enjoyed this late celebrity, he also suffered from depression and ill health until his death in 1924. Today, The Secret Agent is considered to be literature's first serious moral thriller, anticipating the work of writers such as Graham Greene, Arthur Kirstler and John le Carre. Beer, so be it. Let us drink and be merry, for we are strong, and tomorrow we die. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Ossipon? You look glum and seek even my company. Has one of your women killed herself for you? Hmm? 
or are your triumphs so far incomplete? For blood alone puts a seal on greatness, blood, death. Look at history. You be damned. Why, let that be the hope of the weak, the source of all evil on this earth. Ossipon, <laughs> you couldn't kill a fly. You dream of a world like a beautiful and cheery hospital. 200 years from now, doctors will rule the world. Science reigns already, in the shade maybe, but it reigns. And all science must culminate at last in the science of healing. Mankind wants to live. Mankind? Mankind does not know what it wants. The weak, the silly, the flabby, the cowardly, they have the power. The multitude. Exterminate, exterminate! That's the only way of progress. What's that paper? Anything in it? Nothing. The thing's ten days old. I must have forgotten it in my pocket. What do you know of madness and despair? There are no such things. All passion is lost now. The world is mediocre, limp, without force. And madness and despair are a force. You are mediocre. Verloc, whose affair the police managed to smother so nicely, was mediocre. And the police murdered him. He was mediocre. Everybody is mediocre. Madness and despair. Give me that for a lever and I'll move the world. Ossipon, you have my cordial scorn. You have no force. And let me tell you that this little legacy they say you've come into has not improved your intelligence. You sit at your beer like a dummy. Goodbye. You profess you are strong because you carry in your pocket enough stuff to blow yourself and 20 other people into eternity. And eternity is a damned hole. It is time that you need. The incorruptible professor only smiled. He walked away, averting his thoughts from the odious multitude of mankind. He had no future. He disdained it. He was a force. His thoughts caressed the images of evil and destruction. He walked frail, insignificant, shabby, miserable, and terrible in the simplicity of his idea, calling madness and despair to the regeneration of the world.